For me, a new console has a bit of sweet taste. On one hand, you have access to the newest and greatest games. On the other one, all the games you will no longer be able to play. And while Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo have tried to take advantage of the retro market, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to play everything on the same console? The possibility of installing RetroArch on a console is not new. But for the first time, we can do it without having to hack, root or put it in development mode. And it's completely free. Let's see how. Welcome back, I'm Claudio and this is Zero to Tech. Perhaps you already heard of installing RetroArch and other emulators on your Xbox, but the process required you to sign up as a developer, pay a $25 fee, and put your console in development mode. And then you have to switch between development mode for emulation and retail mode for the rest of the games. Not bad, but not great. Now, thanks to Gamer13, we have this process where you can install RetroArch and other emulators on your Xbox One or Xbox Series without hacking rooting or development mode. You just need your Xbox, a Windows computer and a USB. And I think there is no better option for this than the Xbox Series S. With half of the price of the Series X, it is by far the cheapest way to have a next-gen console. Yes, it has less RAM, less hard drive and you won't be able to play 4K, but it includes everything you need to play the same games. And the most important, at least for the video, you can use it to emulate PlayStation 2, GameCube, Wii, and any previous console directly in RetroArch at full speed. It's hard to find a device with that much gaming power for this price. Let's see how to do it. First, we will use Edge on the Xbox, which is the Microsoft browser. It should be in the App section. If by any chance you cannot find it, you might need to update your Xbox. Then just open it, and once inside, navigate it to this address. Once it loads, download the application by clicking Download App. In the message that appears, simply press open. It will show you an installation screen. Hit the get free button and with this the installation will start. And once it's done, you have a new app called App Store with this icon. When you open it, you will see that there are several applications available. The ones that matter to us right now are the emulators, not just RetroArch. There are also standalone versions for PPSSPP, DuckStation and Flycast. So select RetroArch and then the install button then the get free button. This will install RetroArch directly on your Xbox. At the end, we can open it from the main screen or from the side menu and jump right into the awesome UI, based on the Switch. This version of RetroArch has some details that requires a bit more setup. Let's see everything you must do to play. If you have any problems so far, don't worry, at the end of the video I'll check the most common errors and how to solve them. Once you open it, you will notice that the letters are pixelated. This might remind you the first time you put RetroArch in any other platform, where for a moment it looks like this. But here, we must download some updates manually. We do this by going to the online updater. And now, we're going to select Update Assets. When it finishes, it will change to the normal letter. Then go down and select Update Controller Profiles. Then Update Databases. And we also select Update Core Info Files. As a last step, Activate the option that says On Demand Thumbnail Downloads. Don't leave the screen just yet. If you want to play GameCube or Wii, we need to download Dolphin's additional files. So go to Core System Files Downloader and select Dolphin.zip. And finally, I like to use the XMB menu. <laughs> yes, to make the Xbox look like a PlayStation. So we go to Settings, Drivers, Menu, and select XMB. Now, RetroArch only saves the changes to the settings when you close it directly from RetroArch. But if you want to make sure that the changes are saved, go to the main menu, configuration file, and select save current configuration. Finally, to apply the new UI, select close RetroArch from the main menu and launch it again. Now let's set up the hotkey so we can exit the games. This is done in settings, input, hotkeys, and select menu toggle controller combo. As the only controller we can use is the Xbox One, we can easily set it up to L3 and R3 with no issue. You can save this next step, but for testing it's always good to have the frame counter. To activate it, we go to settings, on-screen display, on-screen notifications, notification visibility. 
and turn on the Show FPS option. It will appear immediately in the corner. And that's it, that's all the setup you must do. Now, let's see how to add games and other files required to play. The next thing is to add your ROMs and BIOS files for the console that need them. Normally, we do this directly in the RetroArch directories, but being an Xbox, the file system is not accessible. There is a way to copy the files into the Xbox hard drive, but it's easier to use an external USB device, no matter if it's a pen drive or a hard drive. To set it up, you will need a Windows 10 or 11 computer, and the USB must be in NTFS format. Simply connect it to the computer, then right-click on it and select Format. Make sure that NTFS is selected, and click Start. Be careful, because this deletes everything on the drive. Once it's done, you can copy your games into the drive. In my case, I have everything prepared in a directory with the ROMs. Inside, I have a subfolder for each console that we're going to emulate. ROMs can be in zip format for most consoles, but if the console uses disk media, use instead CHD, QBIN, ISO, or GCZ, depending on the console. I'm also going to add a subdirectory for the BIOS we're going to need. Remember that you must provide these files. I cannot tell you where to get them. Once you finish copying your ROMs to the USB, you need to assign a special permission to the folder, so RetroArch can read the directory. To do this, right-click on the folder, then Properties, now select Security, then click on the Advanced button, then select the Add button, then select Principal, now the Advanced button again, and select Search. Now look into the list for the permission called All Application Packages and click OK, again OK, and again OK. And on this screen, select the check below that says Replace permissions of child objects. Then close with OK, you will get a confirmation message. Select Yes. And you're ready. Unplug the USB and plug it into your Xbox. When you connect it, the Xbox will tell you that it's detected. Now in RetroArch, the first thing we must do is to change the BIOS directory. For this, we go to the configuration, then we go down to the last menu called Directories and select the first option, System slash BIOS. Here, we're going to navigate to D, which is the letter that the Xbox assigned to the USB. If you have more disks connected, it may be other. We select the ROMs directory, then the BIOS directory. We finish with Use this directory. Remember to save the settings. Now, we are finally going to add the games. If you have used RetroArch in the past, you might know about the automatic search process. Unfortunately, it doesn't work here. In fact, I recommend you don't even try it because it can create a playlist that will crash the app. So we must use the manual search, which is a bit more tedious since it's console by console, but remember, you only do this once. To do this, on the main menu go to Load Content, Playlist, Import Content, and then select Manual Search. On the next screen, we start with the content directory. Here, navigate to one of the ROMs folder. Remember that you must do it console by console. So, we're going to start with Dreamcast. Once in the directory, select Search in this directory. Now, go down to System Name and look for Sega Dreamcast. Then, in Default Core, we're going to select again Sega Dreamcast. In some cases like this, you can skip the file extensions, but I recommend you to put them because in some cores, it might not find the games. Simply add zip, chd, iso, or gzz, depending on the files you have, and finish with start search. When we go back to the main menu, we can see that the Dreamcast games are available. And when you select them, the thumbnail should appear as long as you activated the option we said before. Now, repeat the same with all the consoles, by simply changing the directory, the name of the console, the core, and the file extension. I recommend you to do them all in one session, since it saves the settings and it's faster just to change them. At the end, it detected all the ROMs I added, but some of the thumbnails didn't work, especially the ones of the Wii games, and all worked perfectly. Now you can go and enjoy all the retro games you like on your Xbox. This is not a tutorial of how to make each console work. For this, I recommend you to subscribe to the channel and check previous tutorials. 
The idea is to see how each console works in this hardware. So let's dive in. As expected, the assist consoles run perfectly. RetroArch includes cores for almost every console from the 90s back. You will have no problem playing NES, Super NES, Sega Genesis, Game Boy Advance. All 8 and 16 bit consoles will run perfect, including the whole Tower of Terror from Sega. You can use overlays to add effects like scan lights or even shaders. Just to remember, you have to download them first on the online updater before you can use them. The same applies to arcades. You can use both MAME and Final Born Neo. The only catch is that it cannot read the entire .dat file because of its size. So, if you want names and thumbnails, you're going to need to prepare one manually with just your games. At least, you can play Clear Instinct at full speed. The D-pad on the Xbox controllers have a microswitch-like feel that even makes noise. It's not the best D-pad for purists, but it's easy to get used to. If you want other options, there is a version of the 8 bit 2 SN30 Pro 2 for the Xbox, but it's only wired. Let's continue now with the first 3D consoles. You will have no problem playing PlayStation, Nintendo 64, or even Sega Saturn, which is one of the hardest ones for emulation, works perfectly. In all the tests, we didn't have any issue. You'll even be able to upscale the resolution of these two consoles to more than 1080 in the course that allow it. And everything worked fine memory cards, save states, etc. In portable consoles, we skip the Nintendo DS because playing games that require touch is not that easy with a virtual pen, and there is no 3DS emulator. But PSP games run very well, and you can scale the resolution up to 4x and more depending on the game. In general, the experience with this console was perfect, with no slowdowns or visual artifacts, and scaled, the games don't look that bad. The next one to try was Dreamcast, also perfect. It's not a very complicated console to emulate, and its library is full of excellent games that no one played. You can raise the resolution to more than 1080 without problems. Scaled, these games don't look too bad. It might be the last Sega console, but it is so much to play. Now we jump to the more complicated ones, starting with GameCube. In truth, this Xbox has plenty of power to run all the games. Even Automodelista runs up scales to 3x with no problems, and simpler games much more. Even Wii games play well at 3x, but in Tatsunoko vs Capcom it suddenly crashed. We lowered it to 2x and it didn't have the issue again. It's just a shame you cannot pair the Wii mode, that would have been great. And finally, the PlayStation 2 was the one that gave us the most problems. There's a trick to getting it started, but it's the same as in RetroArch for Windows. Just check out the official RetroArch website. We started out testing God of War 2, but it had a strange effect, as if the image is being coupled multiple times. And I couldn't fix it. This limits the performance of the game, but we also tried Ratchet and Clank, and not only does it run flawlessly, we were able to bump the resolution up to 1080 and still played at 60 FPS, with very little drops. I'm going to see what can be done with God of War, but be sure that most games will work for you. Remember that these results were with the Xbox Series S. If you have a Series X, you will be able to raise the resolution up to 4K. But if you're using an Xbox One, some consoles might run slower. Finally, let's talk about some problems that came up, and how to solve them. The first is that when you try to run it, if you get this message, it's because you have too many registered devices according to Microsoft. Many times, this includes older devices you no longer have. So follow the instructions and go to account.microsoft.com. Then go to Microsoft Store Device Management and make sure there are less than 10 devices. The second was some freezes. This happened to us when we closed PS2 games and tried to launch it again or launch another one. And the case we mentioned before with the Wii. If this happens to you, that the screen stays black or frozen for more than a minute, you must force the app to quit. Just press the Xbox logo button on the controller, and in the side menu, select RetroArch and press Start. It will show you a menu with the option to force the application to quit. Really, it's incredible that you can do this with an Xbox without too many issues. It makes it an excellent choice for retro gaming. And I think this Series S is a great option. It's much cheaper than the Series X, but has enough power to play all these games. Now you can have all your retro library on a next-gen console and play everything on the big screen. 
the Xbox controller may not be your favorite for retro gaming, and you have options from 8 bit 2 if you want a top-notch D-pad. I hope you liked the video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and remember, retro games, modern technology, zero to tech.